Okay, uh, well, I'm going to begin by asking you both what first attracted you to getting involved in Face of an Angel. Um, wow, well, uh, funny enough, we were talking about, we were just talking about Michael, and Michael Winterbottom is one of my favourite directors. Um, so I would say the opportunity to work with Michael was an absolute dream, and the script. Those are the two main things that, that drew me in. Yeah. Same. <laughs> Can I just like, no, no, yes, same. I it think, is I think, though. I think Michael's such like his style is so unique, and I think for an actor it is um, so free because he doesn't have crazy script supervision or continuity. And I don't know how, if you felt. And he encourages girl. you to improvise as Very well. Very much so. So like for the court scenes, um, for me anyway. Um, my defence lawyer wasn't an actor. He's a real defence lawyer in that courtroom five days a week. The people like taking you into court, the guards, are real guards. You've got a bank of actors playing journalists braying at you. And you feel, after you know ten minutes, half an hour, that you're actually there. And you don't really feel like you're acting anymore. So it's very immersive and that's very freeing for an actor. Mm. And he lets you decide about your character as well, which is, like, obviously we had, like, some, like... Path, yeah, guidance. Is that, yeah. Um, we had guidance of like who we were supposed to be, but he doesn't he doesn't restrict you in any way, which yeah, as it's quite an actress is and, like yeah. really nice. <laughs> yeah. Is that freedom? Can that be quite daunting at times? And knowing when you've got to go in and improvise means that you've really got to be in your, your top of your game at sort of every day, I suppose. Yeah, it was for me because I've been filming a period drama, so that's like the total opposite of working with Michael. Like that was so restricting in everything, and and it was it was for TV, so you have to like hit your marks and you do one rehearsal and then it's like go. Mm. Whereas with Michael, it's just style. so fluid. Like he he won't say like action and cut he'll just let you keep going Actually, it's really funny he doesn't say action or cut he just softly whispers your name <laughs> Genevieve Genevieve <laughs> it's quite nice because you, you know you, you, when someone says action you're reminded that you're you're, on. you're you, yeah. basically he doesn't pop the suspension of disbelief I was wondering so, I mean because it's obviously, he has a real inclination for kind of realism that's one of his sort of key things but this isn't a who done it is it this is this is absolutely not so how do you describe the face of an angel to people that are so not concerned, but wondering how this approach is quite delicate territory. So it's based on Bobby Letzonado's book, Angel Face, which examines the Amanda Knox trial. But what Michael does is take that as a springboard for the main focus of the film. So the backdrop to Face of an Angel is a murder trial. But the main focus is, is Daniel Brawl's character as a director trying to make a film about a murder trial. It doesn't, as you say, it's not a whodunit. It doesn't even begin to try and project any kind of judicial insight onto that and that's what I felt was fascinating to play my character Jessica because I, I could keep her as an enigma and that, that's what she was to me and it, I, we didn't have any kind of pressure to try and um, we're actors we're not we're not lawyers and that was the whole point and um, yeah and it was it was to do with I think like heavily to do with relationships as well exactly and all these different relationships that were going on that's just around the trial yes yeah. and um, and Daniel's character is like yeah his character Thomas is going through a divorce going through a loss which is kind of reflected in the case with the um, with Elizabeth Price's family like because they've obviously yeah. lost their daughter that's what so, Michael does best I guess yeah um, there's a loss of a daughter through violence through murder and then as I saying the loss of his daughter through divorce yeah. in America and he's in Europe so I guess what Michael does best is defy genre it's, yeah, it's, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, it's more to do with, yeah, relationships than, like, this is the trial, like, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And in regards to kind of crafting the characters, because of course, the, you're playing fictional characters that are mm. sort of based on narrative culture yeah. and Amanda Knox. So when inspired. you were... Yeah, yeah. inspired. <laughs> so when you were crafting the role yourselves, how much did you take from... Meredith and Amanda and how much did you tr or did you just completely treat this as a kind of fictional creation? I treated it purely as fictional because I thought that it like it's kind of in bad taste to try and like be somebody's daughter who has been a, a victim of like such a horrible crime um, and yeah so I didn't want to, I don't know if it was any different for you. I found certain details of um, the Amanda Knox trial uh, from costume and hair and makeup and those kind of perspectives quite fascinating because um, the way that 
she dressed um, and the different court appearances I thought was quite indicative of, of the trial by media aspect. And so taking those examples from life was helpful as that, that's what you do as research as an actor because you can cling on to those moments to, to carve your, your way through. But as I said, we, we really, it was a, that, that trial is a springboard for, it's a blueprint of a murder trial. We didn't, we weren't actually examining that particular case. You couldn't even begin to. So there was, it, it, we used it, it was helpful, yeah. but there was no pressure to try and um, be those people. Yeah. Yeah. We, we weren't trying to mirror it. I was wondering as well, I mean, of course, this the, this film sort of marks something of a, a breakthrough as well for Cara Delevingne, of course, who you sort of able to collaborate with. Uh, what did you make of her move in, into acting and, and what was she like to kind of to, to spend time with on set? Yeah, we didn't have any, you know, you had a few scenes Yeah, her. well, I knew Cara I didn't from have before, scenes. anyway. Um, and she's just... She's, you do music videos, she's so, and, yeah, and modelling and stuff, right? She's so cool um, and yeah, she's so she's confident, great. anyway, yeah. that it kind of felt natural for her and I know that she'd always wanted to do acting like before she started modeling as well so I think yeah I'm talking about uh, Genevieve of course you've, you've um, your breakthrough role was in Harry Potter of course I was wondering that must have been an incredible <laughs> an incredible entry into this entire world to, to, to take part in a film yeah. quite I mean obviously I've been on the kind of the Harry Potter studio tour and it's, it's amazing isn't it remarkable I mean yeah. that must have been an incredible experience to, to begin yeah, this it this absolutely life. was um and uh, I remember so vividly, I was 12, I had my, my last audition with Alfonso Cuaron, the director, and I said, um, my character Pansy Parkinson, who's in Slytherin, she would have a vampire bat as a pet. And we kind of had a laugh. And then, you know, six months later we were on set and they had this menagerie of animals. And they introduced me to my vampire fruit bat pet. I mean, as a 12-year-old, it was, it was, people talk about the magic of Harry Potter and that's how I remember it. It was probably artistically um, and the studios and all that kind of aspect of it, it was just the best entry into into filmmaking that you can have, yeah. And you've got Kids in Love coming out quite mm. soon. It's a cameo part, but oh, okay. yeah, we did. I just did it in a day. Was, I, I left the Edinburgh Fringe, I did a musical, Assassins, and I came back for a day and shot it and, and stuff. Cars but in that. Cars Cars in that, that yeah. so random. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. so that's written by Sebastian and Preston, who are both such young writers. Yeah, I know, it's amazing. I mean, what's it? Does that is there something quite unique and quite fresh about reading a screenplay written by a, a contemporary? I suppose someone who's sort of quite young and, and sort of up and coming themselves. I think so. I mean, um, oh, it's it's a it's a fresh kind of coming of age drama, and I guess the closer you are to that age, the more um, sensitively you can deal with that area. Yeah. I mean, talking of young filmmakers, you're of course in <coughs> Just Jim, mm, which yeah. is Craig Roberts' directorial yes. debut. Uh, what, what's he like as a, as a filmmaker? Because again, he's, he's obviously sort of so new to yeah, this. Yeah, I think because he comes from like an acting background and he's obviously had the chance to work with so many different directors, he's picked up, I'm sure he's picked up like traits and things from lots of different people. Um, he's so calm as a director, which I didn't really expect him to be. I don't know why. Um, so yeah, he's and he wrote that himself as well, and it's based on on kind of his life growing up in Wales. So yeah, it was great. So I mean, can, is that something? Is this sort of seeing other people sort of your age kind of go into the writing and directing process? Does that inspire you? Do you I'm think actually writing something right now, um, I, but for theatre, a one woman show. Um, yeah, I can't. I don't want to say what exactly yet, but I found a a, a biography of a rather extraordinary woman's life. Um, and I think that it needs it's a story that needs to be told. So yeah, no, I am, I am, and yeah, we look at two of these kind of people like Craig. You know, it's amazing. And I think it's great fun if if you can do it. So yeah. Do you think that that's something to do with the kind of modern society? I mean, obviously with things like YouTube, it kind of inspires anyone to go out there and make movies now. Do you think yeah. that it's not surprising this is coinciding with this rise of young people sort of, and and yourself kind of writing? Do you think that it's come from a kind of born out of a kind of I don't know. This kind of YouTube generation, I suppose. That we're, we I think are. people have always aspired to be creative, but I say that is one of the most positive aspects of everything technological now is that those mediums are more accessible. Yeah, you know, I if think you can film something, film something on your phone. Why not? Or, <laughs> you film know, a whole movie on your phone. No, no, do it. no. But I mean, you know, shooting stuff. You don't need you don't need a whole crew to to, to get something across, and you can put a portfolio together. I think it's quite liberating for people. Yeah, I think we're we're in a generation as well where people don't pigeonhole you into being an actor, a director, a writer, whatever. So it's 
it's yeah there are more opportunities now to explore all these different yeah and uh, I guess my, my sort of final question really just back to the face of an angel I was just wondering what it was like to shoot in in, in Italy if you're both out there because I mean it's, it's one of the greatest yeah, countries really useful, oh yeah. it must make work just a little bit easier I suppose yeah, oh. yeah it does yeah, all it the food as well <laughs> food yeah. and wine it does make it Sienna is stunning it's absolutely stunning. stunning like there was um, we went I think it was our last day wasn't it that um, is a shot of me with the background the landscape behind and we were there and it was like it doesn't seem real because it was so Plus picturesque. Plus the landscape, yeah. yeah. All the colours. And there was like, like an impressionist mist, painting. It's just beautiful. The mist coming across the hills yeah. and things. And yeah, it was just the most beautiful location. It's medieval. Like, you know, it's got a lot of history. And we got to go to Flo- I got to go to Florence anyway for a day and have a look around. And yeah. We were pretty spoiled filming there. I'm going to Florence this summer. So if you've got anywhere oh, that you could yeah. recommend. <laughs> Um, <laughs> just off the top of your head. Yeah. Well, obviously the the Uffizi is the main gallery. You've got to check that out. Yeah. Um, all the Botticelli's and everything. And um, there's a, a the cathedral, uh, Santa Maria de Fiore. That's the main kind of one. It, it's it, you, you'll kind of get a yeah. sense of it as you go around. <laughs> you find it out for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for your time. That's today. right. Much thank you. It. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching. Hey, you guys. Hey, you guys, huh? Hey, you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed. Yeah. Nice. Hey, you guys.